ask. Okay, let's just go to starting the presentation. Okay, so what I'm, I'm talking, I'm going to talk about three things actually. There's, the main topic is just how appallingly bad the work of neoclassical economists has been on climate change, breathtakingly bad, but I got asked to cover a bit about inflation as well, how you'd see that from a non-orthodox economics perspective. And we're talking away about all the, 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 the drudge they drag you through trying to derive macro from micro. So I'll show you, you don't need to waste your time in micro, you can derive macro directly from macro. So I'll cover that at the end. So just, just as a personal perspective, I've been a critic of mainstream economics since 1971. So it's going to 50, 51 years of being a critic. And um, I've never seen anything as bad as what they've written about in, in terms of climate change. I've got plenty of criticism of their theoretical approach in general. But uh, when I dived into the climate change stuff, I only thought I could dive in there after I'd made some sort of positive contribution. And that was really saying, how do you explain the role of energy in production? How do you make energy a, 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 the essential part of production? We, we know it must be from the laws of physics. And that little insight there occurred to me walking through a friend's house, which was full of statues, uh, that labor without energy is a corpse and capital without energy is a sculpture. So mathematically what that means is, rather than tacking energy on as a third factor of production, which is the way neoclassicals handle it, you use energy as an input to both labor and capital without which they can do no work. And that completely transforms the, uh, the role of energy in your production functions. Now, so once I'd done that, I thought I'd start reading the neoclassical literature. And I really thought I'd have to be explaining why a Ramsey growth model is the wrong way to model climate change and why you shouldn't use the high discount rate, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what all my colleagues told me I'd find. Why bother? You know, that's what you'll find. Instead, I found the most delusional set of assumptions about what climate change actually was. Empirical stuff, which could be evaluated and criticised by a physicist, a climate scientist quite easily. Only they didn't do it because of the, they don't referee economics journals. So this stuff got passed by economists who know as little about the climate as the economists writing this, this stuff do, even less perhaps. And it's really, it, I just couldn't believe how bad this was. Um, so I haven't even got to the stage of critiquing the Ramsey model's use in this model. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, even if you fed a decent post-Keynesian model in with these numbers, you'd still get nonsense coming out the other end because the empirical assumptions are just crazy. And it's not denialism in the sense of denying that climate change is happening. It's denying that it matters using numbers that are completely irrelevant to climate change. And if I have to see why they do this sort of stuff, and again, having spent the large part of my life in economics departments surrounded by neoclassical economists, the mindset that I find they get stuck in is that capitalism can cope with anything. Most flexible social system, you know, people respond to incentives, et cetera, et cetera. So inherently they think nothing can challenge capitalism, therefore, global warming can't be a problem. That's about the only way I can make sense of the sort of statements I see. So when you read the academic literature, this is what you find in refereed journals. Nordhaus talking in 1991, which is where he began developing his DICE model, non-climate variables swamp climatic considerations in determining economic efficiency. Now, at the moment, that's true. That's also completely irrelevant to climate change. Okay. It's just crazy that that is, why bother? If you're doing proper editing, that would have gone from the chapter. It's a pointless comment. And then at the end of it, he says, damage from three degrees of warming is likely to be one quarter of 1% of national income. And my hunch, now what the hell is the word hunch doing in a, in a referee journal, okay? This is the standard where this economics, and this is the economic journal, by the way. This isn't your, you know, you can put it down as a third rate journal. This is the, e the economic journal produced by the Royal Society. They published a word, a journal with the word hunch in it, okay? Hunch, larger than 2% of total output. Uh, and then he did a survey of so-called experts. These were 19 people. He wrote to 22 and 19 agreed to do it. 10 of them were economists. So the majority of people in 1991 answering his survey about what's gonna happen with climate change were other economists, eight of whom he described as not being specialists in climate change. So why the hell were they called experts? They weren't. He had three scientists in the group, 
One of them refused to answer the questions, and the other two gave answers 20 to 30 times the scale of what the economists had to say. But he said, in average, you average out the 19 or the 18 people who answered your survey, three degrees would be small potatoes. Now, I'm almost certain the person who said that was Larry Summers. <laughs> he was one of the people he had his so-called experts. And this is also surely Larry. He would take a very sharp pencil to see the difference between a world with and without climate change or with and without mitigation. In other words, it's trivial. This is all economists reinforcing the biases that other economists have about stuff they know shit all about. Now, in, in the middle of all this, he also says natural scientists, these are two people, because the third one refused to answer the questions. He thought the questions were absurd. But 20 to 30 times the scale of what the non-expert economists had to say. He said, this is an interesting topic for future research, which he never did. Then you have the 2014 executive summary. Now, I've got a rent down there as the main author, but does anybody else know who's the other co-author to the night 2014 um, IPCC economics chapter was? Uh, Richard Toll. I think you know the name. Okay. So, the, again, they're saying for most economic sectors, the impact of climate span will be small. Medium evidence, but a high agreement. This is groupthink. Now, politicians trust economists, despite the record they have a complete failure of predicting anything. Um, but you, you find this is, this is what they published in that refereed paper. So this is the AER in 2018, a 7.9% fall in GDP from a six degree increase in global temperatures. Okay. Uh, and 2021, I, I had a paper rejected from a journal by, of course, neoclassical referees who said nothing like what you're criticizing could possibly be published now, well, virtually the same day that I got that rejection, these three papers came out. This is Warren Hope and all saying that a, a four degree increase in temperature will cause a 3.67% fall in GDP. Now, notice the two decimal places of accuracy. They can't even get today's GDP right to one decimal place. And they're trying to predict what's going to happen in 80 years time to two decimal places. And what they're saying, by the way, is that this is the 3.67% fall relative to what would have been GDP in the absence of climate change at all. In other words, they're assuming growth for the next 80 years and saying climate change will, at four degrees will make it 3.67% smaller than it would otherwise be. So rather than being five times, it'll be 4.8 times as large. Uh, another one, 7.22% fall from a 3.2 degree increase over the next 80 years. And the final one, the tipping points. Now, these tipping points, this is losing the Arctic, Greenland, the West Antarctic, the Amazon, the AMOC, the Indian monsoon, ocean methane hydrates and permafrost. That'll increase damages by 1.4% compared to those not tripping at all. Uh, and the IPCC 2022 report comes out and says that a, a 10 to 23% decline in annual GDP relative to global GDP without warming. In other words, less than a 1% fall in annual growth rates. That's the sort of stuff you get out of this literature. Now, when you read the scientific literature, it's completely different. They are talking about existential risks at one or two degrees of Celsius. Uh, Hansen, who's the guy who really identified the importance of this way back in the 60s, said that two degrees could be dangerous. The sort of danger he was talking about, by the way, in this article was that the last time we lost the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which you might know colloquially as the Gulf Stream. It was back in what's called the Eemian period. And then in examining the paleontology of, of that period, he found that there were, in the Bahamas, he located this particular uh, instance, islands on which waves were thrown, waves were throwing stones onto the shores. Now, these stones were 1,000 ton boulders. And they were, he said this, you estimated the size of the waves that were generating that. And these were not cyclones, these were the average storms of the period, were generating waves up to 45 metres. Now that'd be fun, wouldn't it? 45 metre wave at Brighton? It might even reach here. <laughs> and Stefan at all saying that when we hit go, they use two degrees just being conservative. They really think it's more dangerous at about one. But a two degree in rise in temperature could cause a range of tipping cascades to tip off all those tipping points and bring about a completely different climate than the one we're used to. So the scientists are terrified of one and two degrees. The most they'll twist themselves to is talking in terms of three. The economists are blase about six. Who knows more about climate change? It's not a contest. <laughs> the question is, how did they get these low estimates? And that's why I found it just crazy. 
uh, effectively, we're safe here, climate change won't affect us because we've got a roof above our heads. Now that's being facetious, but this is what he actually said. Activities such as microprocessor fabrication are undertaken in carefully controlled environments that will not be affected by climate change. And he then says that applies to 87% of GDP. That's all of manufacturing, even included mining. Okay? All of manufacturing, all of wholesale and retail services, all of the finance, industrial and real estate sector, except for that strip on the coast. It's just incredible how much he left out. And he said for the bulk of the economy, it's difficult to find major direct impacts over the next 50 to 75 years. And that's the basis of saying you get one quarter of 1% uh, damage. Here's the IPC back in 2014. Agriculture, forestry, fisheries and mining are exposed to the weather and thus vulnerable to climate change. Other activities taking place in controlled environments not really exposed to climate change. The same line you saw from Nordhaus in 1991, regurgitated by the IPCC 23 years later, rather than rejected as nonsense, which is what it should have happened to it. And uh, I just I like this particular news item from earlier this year in China, which is now having a, a you know, unprecedented, in, in terms of global history, unprecedented drought. And as part of that drought, they've had to turn off their microprocessor plants so they can't get water for them anymore. There's a fairly direct impact for you from climate change. Uh, now, what they started doing initially was they used the data on GDP now and temperature now in different regions, pretty much gross state product rather than gross national product initially in America, and said, you know, what's the temperature in Idaho and what's the temperature in New York and the temperature in Florida, and then the GDP in each of those locations. And they assumed that the data they got out of that, which as you can imagine would show a fairly weak relationship, uh, could be used as a proxy for climate change. And that's how they got their numbers of what's going to happen with you know, up to 10 degrees of climate change, they simply said it's going to be the same as moving from a place that's here that's 10 degrees warmer. At the moment, that sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? But it's hardly a description of climate change. Now, they ignore precipitation, and this is priceless. Um, the the uh, paper that I'm looking at here is on tipping points. The article they used by an economist about the loss of the Gulf Stream was a paper by uh, by Toll and a couple of other colleagues. And in that paper, they mentioned that obviously precipitation is an important part of climate change, but we have yet to include precipitation in our climate models. Now, the, the scientists themselves, of course, they include rainfall in their models. The economists in 2021 were still modeling the economy without including the, the, the climate, without including the effect of rainfall, which is just crazy. And this is what and, uh, Antoff, Estrada and Toll had to say to defend not using temperature. IAMs, that's Integrated Assessment Models, that's what economists call their models in climate change, often assume that other climate variables scale with temperature. What does that bloody well mean? Well, they've got an idea of an ideal temperature. So they think if global warming pushes us towards the ideal temperature, it'll also push us towards the ideal rainfall. That's a wonderful assumption, which is complete bollocks. It'd be great if it were true, but it's not the real world. Now, what they've done since then is they've started to realise that it's, in a way, it's, they're realising it's crazy to relate today's data without change in temperature to what's going to happen with change in temperature. So later work is looking at change in temperature and change in GDP over time between 1960 and 2017. And what they then said is, well, we can show that a, if, if temperature increases by 0 0.04 degrees Celsius per year, that'll reduce GDP in 2100 by 7.22% at lovely two decimal places of accuracy. So this is what they did. So the, the dots there are the numbers that other economists have made up about climate change. And most of them you can see are clustered around less than a, hang on, less, let's see if I can get out here, less than a 5%, getting into all, yeah, okay, less than a 5% change for three degrees of warming. But theirs is this band here. That's obviously linear extrapolation. Now that's assuming nothing significant is going to happen to the climate in terms of its structure for the next 80 years as we increase the temperature by four degrees. That is crazy. But this is the sort of nonsense that this crowd has got into regurgitating with each other. And they also believe they can use a quadratic to model climate change. Y equals X squared. The only question is, what do you multiply Y A by Y, y for? What's your, what's your uh, your, your coefficient, and that's what they, they fit their data to. So here's Dietz and Wagner saying tipping points reduce consumption by 1% with 
with three degrees warming and 1.4 based on a second order polynomial fit of the data. They're simply extrapolating using a quadratic. And they then say, well, the catastrophic temperature, therefore, is 17.68 degrees. And nobody in their right minds is talking about that much global warming. That'd be the end of life on Earth, <laughs> except for the tardy grapes. That'd be the only things that survive that much of a temperature increase. But this is the sort of nonsense they're going on with. So there's their prediction of environmental damages. So the coefficient they're using here is 0 0.0032 times temperature squared. Now, crazily enough, that is a larger coefficient than Nordhaus uses in his DOS model. His coefficient is 0 0.00227 just insanely bad. So why do they use a quadratic? Well, they first of all, they think they can, they're, they're looking for the f footprint of global warming and current data, which is crazy because it's a runaway process. You know, we haven't even started to see what it's, what it's going to do, us, do to us. But then they extrapolate that using quadratics. And I'm not the first person by far to criticize them for doing this. There's lots of people who said, stop using quadratics, it's just crazy. Uh, this is Weitzman who committed suicide shortly after Nordhaus got the Nobel Prize. Um, I would have committed a different crime. <laughs> uh, and Pindic saying that their, their functions are made up out of thin air. Now this is in the refereed publications too, by the way. So imagine getting science journals where another scientist can say, and quite rightly say, that what you're using is made up out of thin air and get it past the referees. This is the state of the discourse on climate change in economics. So I want to show you the difference between using a quadratic and using a more sensible function, like an exponential or a logistic curve to say what's to fit the data. So what they've done is, first of all, they've, they've made up their own numbers. Every study that economists have done where they fit a function to climate change is using numbers they derive themselves which is sus to begin with, okay? You should be using third-party data. So I'm going to use the third-party database. And I'm also going to extrapolate that data using functions apart from just a quadratic to see what happens. Now, as it happens, this beautifully named National Office of Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, in the States, it maintains what they call a billion-dollar database of, of damages with looks at climate or weather damages that totaled more than a billion dollars out of each event and puts the data out over time. And this is plotted as a percentage of GDP over, against the projected anomaly in terms of um, temperature anomaly between 1980 and 2021. So I've used that data and I then fit a quadratic, an exponential and a logistic to those curves to see what I get. And can you tell which function is which? They're identical, okay? They overlap so completely in the data, you simply cannot tell them apart visually or mathematically. So those are the three functions. Now, what happens when you extrapolate them for the, those are the three functions there. What happens when you extrapolate a bit further? So the quadratics are down here. This is the one that I derived from the data. This is Nordhaus's quadratic. This is what the logistics says and that's the exponential. These two are saying nothing to worry about until 2100s. <coughs> These two are saying there's no economy left by 2050. <laughs> that's the one we need to worry about. Now, I'm not saying this is the right way to do it at any means, but it shows the impact of using a more realistic function than the garbage the economists use. <coughs> so what's happened, unfortunately, is that politicians aren't normally scientists. They can't read that literature. Their support staff are normally economists. They read the economics literature. They probably innocently think what the economists have done is taken the science estimates and applied high discount rates to them, exactly what I thought they'd done before I read the literature. They just don't realize how bad the work is. So when this stuff gets read by people in the finance sector, this is the sort of summary they make of it. Why investors need not worry about climate risk. This is the guy who was the uh, HSBC, <coughs> um, I think it was, it was at HSBC, he was part of a Gottmann's company. He had to leave. He's now on a poor man, is now working as a, as a uh, columnist for the Financial Times. <laughs> yeah, so he said, and this is his, and I don't blame him for this because what's happening is his own biases, anti worrying about climate change, are being reinforced by economists who've got the same biases when he thinks they've actually done scientific research to back this up. So he said, the first argument is going to hit future growth. 
Uh, they say it's going to hit by 2100. The worst case lops off 5 per cent. That was true of the 2014 report. Now they're saying 23 per cent. But that's still saying the economy is going to be four times bigger than it is today in per capita income terms rather than five. So it's not, you know, you said you won't even notice, and that's still true. So the worst case lops off 5 per cent. They failed to tell us we're going to grow a lot. The world's going to be 500 to 1,000 per cent richer. You're not 5 per cent. Who cares? You will never notice. And that's the mindset that dominates finance and it dominates really how most of our politicians really think about climate change. <clears throat> so what we have to do, the real, real thing, we've got to change the framing from cost and benefit to existential risk. That's what we need, which we should have been doing since 1970. We've wasted a half a century out of this. And when you look at the scientific research, the type of arguments that scientists are making are that we have lived in an oscillating cycle uh, using what's called Milankovitch cycles between uh, long interglacials and short warm periods. Okay? If you go back over the last 800,000 or a million years, you find temperature peaking about half a degree above pre-industrial levels and then down to four to six degrees below. And that's a regular limit cycle we've been in before humanity discovered coal. When we discover coal, we push ourselves over here with energy and they're saying, unless we're not careful, we will drop into a cascading runaway process. We'll end up in an Earth which is uninhabitable by our species and quite a few others. But what we've got to do is move over here. Now, the economists are the main ones stopping us doing that. So they're saying they see two degrees as a planetary threshold, not the six degrees that Nordhaus said earlier would cause a 7.9% fall in future GDP. Okay. This, is, this, this is the difference between reality and what the economists have done. The question is, why on earth are crazy assumptions like this put forward by researchers and, and passed by referees? And it really comes down to Milton Friedman's nonsense idea that the more significant the theory, the more unrealistic the assumptions. Have you had that throttled down your throats here by your, by your teachers, Milton Friedman and methodological, uh, if you call the methodology of positive economics? Now, that's actually been used. The reason that was dreamt up in the first place was because of all the logical errors that turned up in neoclassical economics and empirical errors that they didn't want to consider. So if you make assumptions that support neoclassical theory but are crazy, you'll get refereed and passed. If you make assumptions that are sensible and don't support neoclassical theory, you'll get just rejected. And I call it the neoclassical disease. This innate belief that capitalism can cope with anything. Therefore, climate change can't be an existential risk. I want to show practically why that wrong so badly wrong, and that comes back to ignoring the role of energy in production. Uh, if you, you've done the Cobb-Douglas production function, I presume, ad nauseum, yeah? Okay, that's saying you've got technology times labor times capital. No energy and no material input, okay? It all comes out, out you get goods out, uh, of GDP with just technology, labour and capital in and use the fact that these exponents are based on the share of factors of production in GDP. Now, energy is ignored. That's why that stupid comment wave was made by Nordhaus about not being able to bring any it, it, you know, impact upon manufacturing from climate change for the next three quarters of a century. So when they do bring energy and they tackle it on as the third factor, and this is Engstrom and Gars from 2016, so they act like e, e at the end raised to the new, but that's 0 0.03 because that's roughly the share of energy in GDP. Now, what that means is with the substitution effect of the Cobb-Douglas production function, that means that an 80% fall in energy would cause a 5% fall in GDP. So you have, that's the shape of your function. The horizontal axis is how much of energy you have relative to your pre-crisis levels. If you fall down to having only 20% of what you had, you have just a, fear, a mere 5% fall in GDP. Nothing to worry about, which is going to be fun here over the next two months, isn't it? Because energy may run out, we'll find just how much GDP falls by as a result of that. Now, this turns up in a paper by some German economists saying what happens to Germany if you lose 10% uh, of energy courtesy of Russia. Now, there's been an enormous amount of substitution of energy sources, but not substitution of energy. And that's the important thing. There is no substitute for energy. So their theory using a CES function said a 10% fall in energy will cause a 1.5% fall 
in gross national expenditure. And they, they showed that if you use the strict Cobb-Douglas production function, you get a prediction of a 0.4% fall in GDP. And they ridicule the post-Keynesian, the function of the post-Keynesians like myself use, which is the Leontio function that says effectively a 10% fall in energy will give you a 10% fall in GDP. So there's the Cobb-Douglas production functions prediction. You go from, uh, that's 100% that's of current energy, that's 90%, and that's a 0.4% fall in the amount of output. When they put a CES function with a, I think they had an LCC coefficient of, of 0 0.04 there, then you get a 1.5% fall. The Leontief and post-Keynesian prediction is down here. And they ridiculed that, which I found looked quite amusing. Um, so they said, um, contrary to fears voiced in the public debate, substitution and reallocation. Reallocation I can take seriously. Substitution, no. Uh, but they said it was just less than 3% of GDP. And public fear mongering about the impact doesn't live up to academic standards. But these are neoclassical standards. So let's take a good look at them. So he rejected the idea of the post-Keynesian production function on the basis that if factor markets are competitive so that factor prices equal marginal products, then a Leontio function would mean that the price of energy would jump to 1 over alpha, which is 25, and the others would fall to zero. These are nonsensical predictions. Don't take them. He's right. They are nonsensical. Trouble is the data says the relationship is one for one. The correlation of change in energy the change in GDP at the global level is 0.83. And the, the, the scale is literally one for one. So there's the, the, that's, the energy is the red line and GDP the blue. This is global energy and global GDP. The energy data is coming from the OECD, the, the GDP data from the World Bank. And the correlation coefficient of the changes is 0.83, which is crazy high. And they're literally the same scale, slightly higher change in GDP for the change in energy. So that base much says, yes, empirically, Leontio fits the data. And this is one of the great co quotes in science, the great tragedy of science, a beautiful theory destroyed by an ugly fact. The ugly fact is the Leontio function fits the data, the neoclassical does not. So what Bachman has actually done is give another empirical disproof of neoclassical economics. So they're ignoring energy here. Let's just take a look and see what's going on. There's energy, there's technology times labor, times capital and the exponents sum to one, which is reasonable, that's constant returns to scale. Uh, but they, what they do is they equate those to income shares. So they assume the coefficient for labor is labor share in GDP, roughly 0 0.7, 0 0.65, capital 0.3, and they assume that's equal to the real wage rate and the profit rate. Uh, <clears throat> so putting all that together and treating energy the third factor, that's gonna be about 0.3.4. Now, what I've argued is energy is an input to labor and capital. So let's see the mathematics of doing that. It's not Y equals A times L times K times E. It's L as with the input of E and K with an input of E. So if you get about the coefficient for energy, the only exponents there now are the original ones, the alpha for labor and capital. Now, I'm gonna unpack L of E and K of E and say, well, it's roughly speaking the number of workers and the number of machines times the energy consumed by labor and the energy consumed by machines times the efficiency with which that energy is turned into output by both labor and machines. And that's a simple way of bringing in the fact that energy is an input. Now, the amount of energy we can put in, but we, we consume an enormous amount of energy as workers, okay? <clears throat> Not actually doing work, the energy consumption we have on a daily basis is huge. But a trivial amount of that energy goes into actually producing output. And if you're working as an unskilled labourer, the maximum amount of energy you can put in is about 100 watts. And that's about the same as Spartacus could manage 2,000 years ago. So there's been no change. That's a constant. <clears throat> but the amount of energy that a machine can put in has grown dramatically. There was the, the James Watt steam engine used to consume about effectively 30 tonnes of coal per day. The... Falcon 9 rocket consumes 20 million tons per day. Okay, If it went for an entire day, it doesn't, it goes for minutes. But the energy throughput is that much higher. Anyway, you take the Cobb-Douglas Cobb production function with those redefinitions I've shown, rearrange things a bit, 
And there's you, you finally end up, there's your Cobb-Douglas production function minus the A term. For A, I've got the constant related to labour times the energy efficiency and out, <coughs> the efficiency with which machines turn energy into useful work raised to the coefficient alpha. Now that means my coefficient for energy is not the 0.04 that uh, <coughs> Backman and Co used, 0.3, 10 times the number they use. So rather than saying you get a 0.3% change, you're going to get a 3% change, <coughs> which itself is starting to get significant. But it's not enough to fit the data. Uh, the reason the Cobb-Douglas prediction uh, data uh, function fits the data is it's a tautology. Okay, it's a nonlinear rearrangement of income equals wages plus profits. That's all it is. There's a wonderful paper by Anwar Sheikh that establishes that in 1974. So it fits the national data because it's it's regressing the national data against a transformation of the national data. Of course, the correlation coefficient is going to be high, <coughs> but Mankiw, Gregory Mankiw, did a beautiful piece of work back in '95, where he tried to fit the Cobb-Douglas production function to international data. He said the only way you can get a close fit was by making the coefficient for the capital not 0.3 but 0.8. And I recommend reading that paper. It's a very, very good paper. So that's 20 times what the economists use, uh, and that would then mean a 10% fall in energy would cause an 8% fall in GDP. But even that's not enough because, as I said, the empirical data is one for one. So let's look at why Why does this apply and what does it do to the equation that the post-Keynesians use of a simple constant relationship between GDP and capital? Well, the post-Keynesian term is, I'm using Q there uh, for quantity of output, capacity utilisation times capital divided by the capital output ratio. Now, if I feed the same argument in, expanding K of E into K times E K times little e K, then I get this expression. And that uh, that there is output in widgets, which is effectively what we're talking about for a, a single commodity model of GDP. This is the energy equivalent in energy terms divided by the energy uh, per widget. And what you find the empirical leonti of being that expression, when you rearrange it, the, the what you call the capital output ratio is the inverse that the efficiency with which machine returns energy into useful work. So the Leontief function survives bringing energy in. You just have to rename what you call capital output to being the efficiency of conversion of energy. And then you get the linear relationship we see in the actual data coming out of that. So uh, when I, uh, just, I was just going through here and showing what, what Backman got wrong in this particular paper. So he said a 10% fall in energy, 0.4% in fall in GDP. And he said intuitively, the Leontief assumption means energy is an extreme bottleneck in production. Yes, it is. Nothing can be done without energy. But this is what's left out of neoclassical production theory. So uh, that's where I come back to my, my comment later, where that energy is a corpse, capital without energy is a sculpture. So your mathematical form puts energy inside as an argument of K and L rather than an independent factor. Um, and then you get this, this is, the, this is the data, by the way. The horizontal is the uh, world energy in kiloton uh, of oil equivalent. And the vertical is GDP in America, and I think it's 2000 and 2010 US dollars. It's literally a linear relationship over 40 years, 50 years of data. And when you do the changes, that's your relationship as well. So we have to include energy in how we think about the economy. So what that means is that the, 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 the post-Keynesian thing fits the data. It's realistic. It, it survives bringing energy into the argument. And what you can get out of it, and I've done this with a, a couple of mathematical and uh, um, meteorological friends, is build models based on what's called Goodman's model of cyclical growth using my Minsky software. So I'll explain that in a short while. I, I know this is stuff you people haven't experienced before. So what we should really be doing is not debating how many percent damages to GDP occur. We should be saying, how the hell do we finance the rapid transition we need right now? That's what economists should be doing. And they don't bugger all about it because they don't understand money. This is where modern monetary theory comes in. I know Randy Ray has spoken here and also Warren, hasn't he? Or, yeah. Okay, okay. So what you see when you look at that is that government deficits create money. 
The government doesn't borrow, it creates money. When it sells bonds, the bonds are bought by the banks using reserves that are also created by the government spending. So what you get out of it is that we can finance, we, we can create the money necessary to attempt to address climate change. Whether we'll succeed is a totally different question. But these are the sort of questions that economists should be answering, showing that money, the money can be created to harness the resources to try to attempt to fight climate change. The reserves will, will be purchased using bonds, which provide an income stream to the banks. And if the bonds are sold to the public, that doesn't finance the spending, it reduces the, the public's capacity to buy frivolities when you're trying to focus as much of production as you can on fighting climate change. That's what we should be doing. And I recommend this paper by Beersley Rummel back from 1946, by the way. We knew this stuff after the Second World War. We're now relearning it despite the resistance of neoclassical economists. So uh, when again looking at that dependence upon energy, because we are going to cause dramatic climatic events in the next 10 to 20 years, if we're lucky, and we don't have anything like the level of renewable energy or non-fossil fuel energy to maintain our current civilization, we'll be forced to reduce GDP, whether you want to or not. Okay? Degrowth is inevitable. It's a question of what the form of that takes. It'll happen long before we hit the sort of four degree and six degree levels that economists are talking about. Um, and what's really gone on, we've, we've dramatically overshot what the biosphere can sustain of our civilization at the moment. And if we, if we now try to adjust without addressing income distribution, we're going to have revolts. You would have seen with the Gilets jaunes in France back in what, 2019, about a century or so ago. Um, when, when Macron put up the diesel tax, supposedly for climate change reasons, really to try to meet the Maastricht Treaty budget constraints, uh, there was a revolt by, the, by uh, working class people and self-employed because they couldn't afford the price increase. Now, we simply can't allocate energy or indeed living standards in that world because the poor will starve and so you'll have social breakdown. So I think the only way to go about it is something which rations in some way energy consumption. And there's a proposal on that website, ecocore.org, to bring about a parallel currency. So we have money as, as now, okay, we'll have money income. We'd also get carbon credits allocated to us through a digital, a central bank digital currency on a daily basis. You could set that level at the level which would uh, enable the average for the country and 95% of the population would be below that level, given the skewed distribution of income. So the top 5% or maybe the top 1% would need to buy off the bottom 95 or 99% to do their consumption. And it would be a market mechanism. <clears throat> no trying to decide a carbon tax as some expert, knowing what the price should be, which economists have never got right. Let the market work it out, okay? But do it using a, a dual currency. Now, it's going to be in, politically infeasible to do it. There's no way you could get that through politics right now. But if we start seeing major crises, then at that point, the government might well find itself spending in the way that it did during COVID to give people money so they can survive despite the fact that they can't work. So I think we can more likely to see massive government transfers coming our way. Yeah. Now, what's your take on credible pollution? Products? Well, carbon is the major form of pollution. So because well, the neoclassical have a different kind of they say we, just speak up for the rest of the here yeah yeah um what they teach in the main and the courses are i take is uh they sell it to businesses specifically rather than every everyday people so they can have the right to pollute mm. and then the more efficient businesses would sell it to the less efficient businesses who need it so rather than us using carbon credits it's just for your companies i think it's got to be everything and uh, and, and and you know those schemes haven't haven't come in um, and you, they're not going to necessarily mean that the consumers get to consume what's necessary to stay alive. You've got to make that your first priority. So I, I prefer tradable carbon credits. Now, one of the dangers is can we actually do it in engineering terms? This particular paper is written by a friend of mine, so I've got a bit of a bias, but I've got to say that he's had critics coming back and saying he's exaggerated the need for batteries to sustain a, a, a post-fossil fuel world. But his argument is that we simply we simply don't have the resources to completely replace fossil fuels. Now, I've seen that disputed just recently in other refereed papers, so I'd 
recommend checking out and comparing comparing the two arguments. <clears throat> but his argument was we'd need 800 new nuclear power stations and 12,000 hydro and 63,000 wind farms, et cetera, et cetera, to build the infrastructure we need. And there's all sorts of disputes in the engineering community about how sustainable fossil uh, 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 photovoltaic cells are, wind farms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a huge debate uh, about whether we can or can't replace the fossil fuel energy we currently use with renewable. Um, but this is what we should be doing. Economists should know something about this, and we know bugger all, because there's no relationship in the models you build to the physical environment. And you, you can't produce anything with that matter or energy you find in the real world. Yeah. Do you think that in that control degrowth model that you showed yeah. uh, you know, that week, we would have to use, do you think there's room for a energy transition? Um, I, I think we're going to do this in a chaotic way rather than smoothly. Okay, we've, we've delayed it for far too long. Nobody wants to change direction. We're quite comfortable in the lives we're currently leading. And, and to make that sort of change, you really need people to realise, yes, there's an existential threat. So the reason that England changed so radically uh, with the, for the, the Second World War was because you're about to be invaded by Germany. Okay, existential threat like that, yes, you will accept absolute restrictions on what you can do to avoid the existential threat that, that faces you across the channel. And we haven't yet got to that point, and we won't get to that point, I think, until we have some serious crises coming our way. Um, and the danger is we've got so close to, to dangerous levels of non-substitutable elements. This is the, the table from the uh, European Union identifying elements in the periodic table which are under threat in terms of availability in the next century. Now one of the most obvious is helium. Every time I see a kid's birthday party with helium balloons, I think we're just wasting a resource we can't reproduce on this planet. Okay? There's plenty of helium in outer space, but we need it for industrial processes here. It's not going to be cheap getting hold of it. The one that scares me the most is actually phosphorus, because phosphorus is a critical element. There's no substitute for phosphorus unless you want to evolve into something else. Okay, we all have adenosine triphosphate in our cells. That's why we can move our muscles. If you don't have phosphate, you don't have you, you you're going to die. And there's apparently, I'm not sure about this. I still find it ridiculous. But apparently, most of the world's phosphorus comes from one mine in Morocco. And yet, that's the basis of the industrial agriculture that sustains a population of eight billion people. Now, if we can't use the phosphorus anymore then the population we can support falls from 8 billion to about 1 or 2 billion, if we're lucky, if we get there smoothly, which they've shown, they've shown no signs of doing. These are other elements which are also on the endangered list. So we really are at a critical level of the capacity for us to sustain our industrial civilization on this planet. And it's completely failed. Economists completely failed to think about it. So that's why I like the idea of having a, a universal carbon credit allocated on a per capita basis to everybody in society, that would then be something which the poor could sell to the rich and make a profit out of. So politically, if you had to do it, it'd be politically popular. Of course, you'd never get it in right now, but it's a feasible way to redistribute income as well as reducing consumption and putting enormous pressure on the rich and corporations to reduce carbon intensity. So that's why I want to, want to see that done. So check out that proposal on ecocore.org. Now, in getting to this, we're going to have to rely upon government finance. If we have a shrinkage in the economy, there's no way that normal capitalist business is going to make a profit. Okay. So if you want your cash flow to be existing to enable the monetary system to turn over, you're going to have to have um, money created by the government, the stuff that Randy Ray and Warren Moses spoke to you about, as a way of enabling profits to still be made while we have degrowth going on. I was just going to finish with a, a few points on um, climate sector, then we have a few questions and I'll show the piece on inflation and then also how you can do macro without micro in a moment. But this is the sort of stuff you get um, from out of, out of skeptics. It's always been changing. This is 500 million years of data beautifully put together as a chart to show um, the, the cycles that we, 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 are, we are on one of these peaks. Okay. When you look at the ups and downs of the what's called Milankovitch cycles over the last 800,000 years, they're caused by changes in the orbit, the inclination of the planet and so on. 
stuff that happens very slowly, but causes a cycle lasting about 100,000 years. Our industrial civilization uh, evolved during the, the transition from one to the peak going to the other turnaround point. So you're on a hill, you go up and you go down, it's, it's roughly flat, okay? We've extrapolated that. That's been our only real knowledge of the climate. We've just thought that's normal. And in fact, it was a turning point. If we hadn't started using coal, we'd now be falling into an ice age, okay? the beginnings of one. Uh, so we had, why did we evolve then? Why did we build an industrial civilization then? We only evolved as beings about 300,000 years ago, depending how you date the origins of Homo sapiens. There's only been one melanchivic cycle in that period, 130,000 years ago. We began 12,000 years ago on another peak and the slow, nat the slow change in climate was because we were going from rising to falling temperatures as part of the natural cycle of the planet. And that's what gave us that stability. And that's how we built the sedentary civilizations, starting off in China and Samaria and so on, and extending now through to today. Without that stability, we couldn't have begun agriculture in the first place. Now, what was going to happen anyway was the transition out of that, instead of blasting off in the other direction, in a way which will destroy the stability in the opposing, the opposing way. Uh, and there's all, I've actually heard an economist say this, lots of that probably gets when I wear one less cardigan. I want to give you a few ideas of what that means. Um, this is a, a paper from, from the science literature, and that's, you probably have not even seen this before, I imagine, but there are three circulation cells in each of the hemispheres, what's called the Hadley cell from zero to 30, rising air at the equator, falling at 30. Then you have the ferrous cell, rising at 30, falling at 60, and then the polar, rising at 60, falling at 90. Those are the three cells. And because they're insulated from each other in circulation terms, the tropics are hot, the temperates are cool, and the poles are freezing. Now, one of the scariest papers I've read, probably the scariest paper I've read, is by the professor of chemistry at Harvard University, so obviously a, cra a, a crank, uh, Philip, uh, James Anderson. He's the man who discovered the hole in the ozone layer over the Arctic about 40 years ago. He led the campaign to close the hole quite successfully. Now, his research is involved in sending a plane at an altitude of five metres over the, over the uh, polar regions, measuring methane uh, levels coming out of the ground and so on. So incredibly detailed research. He's also looking at the, uh, the, West, the, the American plains, where you get those enormous storms and tornadoes. And he says that, he argues that when we lose the Arctic, when the Arctic is no longer covered in ice during summer, then rather than reflecting 90% of the energy that falls there, we'll absorb 90%. And that will change those three cells and break them down. Now, I'm just seeing how the scientists dispute his argument. They say it's going to take a lot more than just losing the Arctic. But if he's right, we lose the Arctic. He says we'll go from one, from three circulation cells to one. So you have rising air at zero and falling at 90 which means rainfall at the zero and 90 regions, fairly much drought the rest of the, in the rest of the range, say 20 to 70, except for superstorms, which will also happen. Uh, so it'll destroy the, the regions in which we've maintained our, our sedentary civilizations for most of our agriculture occurs. But that's not the bad bit. It says when this breaks down, at the moment, the troposphere, the area below 20 kilometers above which the area we live in, that's moist, obviously, okay, particularly in London, in England. Um, but the stratosphere is dry. He said, when you start getting a single cell, the storms that occur in the troposphere will break into the stratosphere and take moisture into the stratosphere. No big deal, except that moisture will carry chloride and bromide, partly from our own industrial processes, but also from volcanoes. And that chlorine and bromide will break down the ozone layer, which could mean that the northern hemisphere becomes uninhabitable, which would have a slight impact on GDP, I think. <laughs> so that's the sort of thing he's talking about. Storms, the energy we're now seeing ending up in the Gulf of Mexico, um, blasting heat into the mid Midwest, storms in penetrating the stratosphere and taking ozone-destroying chemicals up there and increasing the rate of destruction of ozone by a factor of 100. That's what we face if we don't try to stop this thing. 
So I think we, what, we, what I see with neoclassical economists, particularly Nordhaus, because he played the major role in trashing the limits to growth when it came out back in 1972, what we've got is people believe they're defending capitalism, they're defending it against the idea that it should have controls on how far it extends. And what they're going to do is destroy capitalism. We won't be in a capitalist economy when we find ourselves fighting climate change. We'll be in a climate version of a war economy where the government directs everything, where the corporations do what they're told, where innovation is only directed at one thing. In the Second World War, it was fighting the Germans, the Nazis. In this one, it'll be trying to survive climate change. It won't be a capitalist economy, and the people responsible for it will be neoclassical economists. Now, what they've done is they've framed a serious issue, an existential issue, as a minor exercise in cost-benefit analysis. And politicians have believed them, but that doesn't matter to nature. So I think we've got far greater damages coming away very, very soon. We're unprepared for it. So I actually gave this talk, part of this talk, to a group called MIR a couple of days ago. And MIR stands for Mirrors for Earth's Energy Rebalancing. And they're one, one of the, they won't have to do geoengineering. This is probably, from what I've seen, the least, in, least intrusive and possibly the most effective form of geoengineering suggested, using recycled plastics to create mirrors on the surface of the planet, which can reflect the energy back into outer space. So that's probably the best proposal I've seen so far. And there'll be side effects from that sort of stuff, but the alternative isn't continuation of life as we have got used to it. It's the breakdown of human civilization. So I would like to see support for groups like me coming out of uh, groups like those. And I'll take some questions well before I talk about inflation. Yeah. So um, it seems that like- uh, you Speak up for the audience, yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. well, it, it, it seems that like in general, like when it comes to, um, you know, like neoclassicals that are pretty big, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you like as a non-neoclassical dude, like navigate that? Like, you know, as like an academic having these uh, papers and like how do you actually like not lose uh, motivation? It's difficult. <laughs> um, I've been doing it for 50 years, so it's become my lifestyle as well. Um, there's a, there's a, in terms of how many people in, who are academic economists believe neoclassical economics, it's somewhere between um, 90, say 85 and 95 percent. Okay. There's a small group which are anti-neoclassical, that's opposed to Kantians, obviously, also Austrian economists to some extent, and Marxists. Okay, so I'm, there's a community of post-Kantians, and I'm part of that community. So having a, a group of like-minded people does help. It's still bloody difficult, and what it means is. Like I've, I've been successful in my long-term career effectively, but I've been successful at low-ranked universities. I won't get into Oxford or Cambridge or anywhere to have with high status uh, because neoclassicals fight like crazy for those positions, but they ignore what happens in low-ranked places like Kingston. So we all get jobs in low-ranked universities and do what we can, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to fight against conventional wisdom. You have to do it. Yeah, um, I, I saw in the news maybe a, a month ago about um, <clears throat> um, Switzerland's plan to offset their um, carbon, reach their 2030 carbon goals by um, by is, is the development projects in um, somewhere in Africa that are about paying for electric electricity. Um, it kind of seems seems a little bit smart, seems a little bit like we're talking about the carbon credit system, but also it has that sort of international development dimension to it. I'm not sure there's something you know about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, how the idea is to... Okay, the whole idea of offsetting, I mean, I've seen a great cartoon with a, a, a woman busting in and finding her husband being unfaithful with a best friend and saying, oh, don't worry, I've, I've paid so-and-so not to have sex with his partner tonight, so it's all okay. I'm sorry, if we, have to do, if we can't offset this thing. It's just too big. I mean, when you look at the level of energy that comes out of non-fossil non fuel sources, it's about 15% of our energy supply, mainly hydro, some nuclear, and then wind and solar make up a small amount of the extra. Uh, we're going to face of the order of that fall in energy consumption, or we're going to make mistakes like England is currently doing, opening up new coal mines, because the immediate impact of being colder and freezing to death over winter will overwhelm any worries about what's the long-term impact for the climate. So unless we treat this as something everybody's all in on, we're not going to succeed. And offsets are another one of those Let's make it somebody else's problem. Yeah. How, how does the um, carbon credit system that you're describing, how does that do it differently then? Yeah, that would be everything. Every, when, you, when you bought anything at all, 
you'd be paying the carbon price as well as the money price. And then if you had a carbon but your know, carbon wallet, which is refilled every day by an injection from the central bank or from the treasury, actually, but coming in from the government, you'd run, when you ran out of carbon, you couldn't shop anymore. Now, if you set it at the average for the country, given how skewed income distribution is, 95% of people wouldn't exhaust their carbon budget, but the top 5% would. So they'd have to buy, you can see, you know, fueling their private jets and so on. <clears throat> they'd have to buy off the poor. So it's it's more universal it's not an offset scheme uh, and you can actually I, the whole idea of trying to work out the right price for carbon to stop west antarctica melting which is you know nonsense numbers from economists we do know how much carbon we we don't really know. we can say how much carbon we know the quantity much better than we know the price so set the quantity and let internal transactions work out the price it still won't necessarily work by the way it won't, it's just setting up a mechanism that i think we'll need for rationing at some point, because when this really hits, we'll be forced to drastically reduce consumption. And unless everybody wears the burden at the same level, then the poor will starve to death and you're going to get social breakdown out of that. So the only way, like, again, like in the Second World War, what you bought didn't depend upon your income, depend upon your ration card. And so I'm seeing this as a way of getting ready for a, a, a global warming ration card. Yeah. So already the high goal, uh, it's a high goal. He criticized the SDG and Paris Agreement because, uh, like the international environmental regime today, uh, relies heavily on technologies such as the uh, negative emission mm, technologies, mm. and it signifies a kind of techno utopianism, yeah, in which we hope for something technological to solve all of our problems. What do you think about that? I agree, it's 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 it's, it's magic, okay. The, the knowledge that the, the economists actually have of technology. Is the same knowledge, knowledge you and I have of magic. Uh, it's just this magical ingredient we put inside there, like the A term in the Cobb Douglas production function, technology. Um, when Cobb and Douglas first built that model, by the way, their A, their A was a constant. Okay? Only later on did they bring in A as a changing item over time because 70% or more of the change couldn't be attributed to either change in labour or change in capital. That's why the A as a changing term was introduced. And in terms of technology, what the hell does that mean? Okay. Uh, it, 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 if you go back 30 or 40 years, you would have been, rather than suffering through learning how to do DSGE models, you would have been suffering building what are called CGE, Computable General Equilibrium Models. And they had the advantage over what you've done, that they actually included input-output data. So you actually knew how many, you know, how many widgets to make another sort of widget. That was part of what you learned. You had to know the, the data for your own country. That was better than what's done now. So, but when you would include that, then your technology is more realistic and you have a handle on it. Economists have said it's basically technology means magic. And magic, the, the VEX is a magic system. And when you look at it, all this stuff has been put forward larger by the fossil fuel industries to avoid having to wind back fossil fuel production. And we've aided and abetted them by taking it seriously. Yeah. So about um, the uh, capital tax per capita, I think it's a brilliant idea, but uh, how does population factor in? Because when you get more population, of course, that's going to yeah. change the dynamic. We, are, we, we, we have lived through what is, should, has been called the Green Revolution. It's actually the Brown Revolution. Because superphosphates are produced using fossil fuels. And without, without the technology to make superphosphate, uh, scientists have estimated the maximum population of the planet would have been about one or two billion people. So we've got about six billion more that have been produced by carbon by, by fossil fuel farming alone. So if we go back to the point where we say we've got to go back to natural cycles rather than the artificial one we've created, then we're talking about a 75% fall in the population of the planet. And I don't want to see that happen in the overnight brutal fashion that humanity has, ha has, has achieved in the past. We have to do it as, easy, as smoothly as we possibly can. Uh, but, you know, I, again, I, I'm hardly optimistic about it. But we, we definitely overshot population. Has anybody here read the limits to growth? Okay, that's your reading assignment for next week. Get hold of it, you can find a copy on the web. And that's what we should have taken seriously. That's what's called system dynamics, applied to the question of the system of the entire planet. Okay. And if we, and there's part of that in all their various simulations, they're only known for one of their simulations called business as usual or the standard run. And that predicts a social a breakdown somewhere between 2030 and 2050. 
which looks pretty damn accurate. Okay, and I've seen they did work by um, uh, Ga Gaia Harrington and uh, who's actually a friend of mine. I've forgotten his name temporarily. Uh, Graham, I can't think of Graham's last name. Uh, two people signing the, the the standard run fits the data pretty well. But in the runs, the only runs they could get to avoid a crisis involve population growth control as well. Okay? You can't leave it out of the equation. Yeah. Do we have historical examples of controlled degrowth? Uncontrolled degrowth? Not controlled degrowth. Uh, given how we handled COVID, I'm not exactly optimistic about our capacity to do that. Uh, if you look at the experts on COVID, and there's one guy called Yanir Bayam, who was the guy who led the campaign to suppress Ebola in Africa in 2014. And he recommended a six week lockdown, which would have eliminated the virus completely. And what happened instead was total chaos, okay. disaster. Now you guys aren't wearing masks, I still am, effectively. Uh, we've, we've completely stuffed that particular public policy program. So I'm not at all optimistic that we can have controlled degrowth, but I want to you know, try as hard as possible to make it feasible. And I think if I look, look at which societies are more likely to achieve it, it's more likely to be authoritarian collectivist societies that do it rather than libertarian ones who will go off and say, you know, you can't tell me what not to eat, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the chaos we've had over COVID is just I think a dry run to how people react to being told we've got to reduce consumption to stop uh, yeah, existential climate change. Yeah. Um, in regards to a carbon rationing system, so have there been any proposed numbers, realistic numbers, in terms of um, the amount of carbon that we should be setting up around? No, I mean, if you look at what they call the carbon budget, that's estimates by the IPCC about how much carbon we can allow get into the atmosphere to keep the rise below two degrees Celsius. And like we're already at 1.2 over pre-industrial levels. And we've, we, we rose by 0.8 between 1960 and 2020. And we're going to, therefore, we're going to rise even more rapidly than that over the next few years. So that carbon budget itself is the hypothetical thing. Uh, you, you, we do have estimates, but again, there, you know, we've, we've, this has never been done before on the planet. And if we get it wrong, we can't go back and try to do it properly the next time. So I just would rather see us trying you know, abjectly to reduce carbon consumption right now. Um, but I'm just realistic, we're not going to do it until we get crises that are so great that even Richard Toll can't claim there isn't one. <laughs> yeah. You're saying that control the growth system yeah. that you were talking about, like everyone working together, you know, according to what the state commands. Yeah. How do you imagine, like, industry or things like that. Would you imagine people like working in building nuclear power plants or building... Yeah, the, the first effort would be to replace as much as possible energy as you could with non-fossil energy. So that would be the... Like in the Second World War, it was making ships and tanks and, and planes. In in this, this war, it'll be uh, producing energy systems that don't use carbon, even if it involves a carbon pulse. Because to do it, we're going to use energy, mm -hmm. and most of our energy is carbon-based. So there'll be a, there'll be a pulse to carbon consumption coming out of the decision to try to reduce carbon consumption. That's the sort of feedback that a system dynamics program can give you that we need to be thinking about rather than the equilibrium nonsense you're learning at university. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't understand what you meant by carbon pulse. Carbon pulse. Uh, if we if we, we have like 85% of energy right now is fossil fuels and 15% renewable or, or non-fossil fuel. If we want to go to 100% renewable, then we've got to use a huge amount of energy to do that. And most of the energy is going to come from carbon. So there'll be a pulse in the carbon production out of the effort to try to reduce carbon consumption. I uh, I used to march against nuclear power in my youth, okay, and nuclear weapons. Uh, I've been persuaded by the engineers who are a large part of the Patreon group that I'm now financially supported by that modern nuclear reactors are much, much safer than the original versions. The main reason is moderation in the original um, nuclear reactors. Moderation is used to slow down the neutrons. When you have a, a fission 
happening. For each uranium atom, you split, you get two to three neutrons coming out of it. They're traveling so fast that if you don't slow them down, they won't hit another nucleus and cause that to fizz to go and come fissile. So the moderators slow down the speed of the neutrons. That used to be, uh, I've forgotten, it was partly carbon, but it was stuff that the um, reactors were embedded, the cause of the radiation core was embedded inside this physical material that would absorb and slow down the neutrons. Then you had rods which were inserted to block the reactions completely. So rods that absorbed neutrons. And if they broke down, then the reactor could get too hot, run away, and have a meltdown of what they call the China syndrome. Modern reactors use what they call water moderation. So they're in water, incredibly pure water, and I believe it's also doped with uh, tritium and deuterium for reasons of the absorption process. That's what slows down the reactions. It's also what takes the heat away from the process. But if the, if the, if the water comes out of the reactor, and you can set the reactor so this happens automatically, the nuclear reaction stops. Okay. So rather than the meltdown we used to associate with nuclear reactors, now it just means if a problem occurs, the power stops, which is much, much safer than what we've... So I'm... And also the, the main claim that they're made by the pro-nuclear people in my circle is that uh, reactor is, it, nuclear power is far more dense. Like a amount of you know, nuclear material you could hold in your hand would provide you with all the energy you need for your entire life. Uh, whereas the, the extensive nature of solar and wind is a problem. It's also the toxic materials that go into making those and the, the waste product you get out of it. So all this stuff, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning more and more towards the nuclear as the way to go rather than, uh, rather than solar or wind. The advantage of solar uh, is, and wind is that it's localised, so you can have local power consumption. And I've seen some plans in wind and new techniques in, in wind harvesting, which don't have the toxic problems or the long-term waste problems either. They don't break down as much because they're made, you make them out of steel. There's a device which I've just seen uh, made by an American firm with no moving parts. That is a wind, a wind farm. And what, it, what it's using is the Bernoulli effect. You have two wings near each other. The wind accelerates because of, when, you, when, you, when the wings come together, the wind speed accelerates. That means that it sucks air out of a, a column and that air is dragging air through a turbine. There's a turbine underground and the turbine spins. But the stuff exposed to the weather doesn't degrade in the way that a, a typical tin turbine does or that, uh, that solar, like solar cells get hit by, you know, get micro fractures caused by hail and stuff like that. And the micro fractures then mean they start to degrade. So there are, there are the various technologies I've seen coming along in solar as well, which might make it more resilient. So there's a, a um, actually a group in Australia producing a solar cell that you can print using an inkjet printer. Um, uh, but the trouble is its efficiency level is 2% and it breaks down in 18 months. So they've got an enormous task to get to the 30% level of other solar cells in the last 25 years. So overall, you know, I'm afraid, I think nuclear. How would you plan for waste problem? Sorry? Or do you think the best solution for the waste problem is nuclear waste problem? You know, nuclear, this, this is the other thing. The nuclear waste is actually so contained, again, with modern. I, I prefer to see us go for a thorium reactors, which have even less waste. But if you, and like I, I'm, I'm still wary about some of the arguments I hear them making, because like obviously when you radiate something, you change its atomic structure. So you're affecting the structure in which the nuclear reaction takes place. And I, I think that's still an issue. But like what they're using uh, is rather than rods, they have sinters. So they just make balls of radium, which pass through the system and, and drop out again. They're making the internal components replaceable. And the amount of waste actually ends up being extremely small. So you, you could even, you know, put it on rockets and ship it to Mars at some point. It's, uh, it, we now have that as a feasible outcome. So the, the, the waste we get out of nuclear is much more concentrated than the waste we get out of fossil fuels, obviously, and also the waste out of renewables. Yeah. Yeah. On, on the topic of uh, Mars, what do you think of the technical advancements towards um, space and or development? I, <laughs> I'm an optimist by nature and a pessimist by experience, <laughs> and uh, I just would like to have some form of human civilization off this planet because I'm not particularly confident about us surviving on it. And like the, the, 
there's a there's a I've forgotten his name, but a great English comedian who wrote a, a book called a book about a, a post apocalyptic, a post global warming world, and it was dominated by Britney Spears Spears uh, evangelical movement, which was anti technology. And I think like if we come through this, and then there's some sort of humanity surviving, who are they going to blame? They're going to blame the engineers. They're not going to blame the economists. They'll blame the technology. They'll be anti-technology. And if you think about the amount we've learned of knowledge of the universe in the last 250 years, it's incredible. And if you go back 250 years, you had people who believed in witches. Okay? And, and, and that was the state of humanity a quarter of a millennium ago. We, we know the structure of the, of the atom. We know the shape of the universe. I would hate to lose all that knowledge. But, I, so, but if, if you watch the survive, society that survives here could be anti-technology and survive because it's anti-technology, because you won't have the waste products that have caused it. And they'd have to live through the chaos of a disturbed environment, but they've got some chance of survival. But they'd be anti-technology. Now, if you get a civilization on Mars, you can't afford to be anti-technology. Okay. You've got to maintain it. So I, I just hope they get to Mars before we wipe ourselves out. Right. I'm, I'm in favour of that. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, in some ways, Western civilization survived the Dark Ages because of monasteries. And the Irish monasteries played a major role in that, but they, they wanted to go to Ireland anyway, back in those days. Okay, pardon me being facetious here. Um, so that isolation was a major part of why we managed to hang on to those works, not lose them all from the days of Rome and, and the Greeks and Aristotle and so on. And I think we need the same sort of isolation now. And to me, that involves another another planet, not hoping to have somewhere that we can preserve that knowledge uh, on this planet. So. Yeah. Do you think that the, the sheer amount of initial CO2 emissions you incur when you build a nuclear power station, which I've heard is like tremendous, do you think the initial cost will be offset by the long-term benefit? No, uh, that's that's a good question, but no. The, uh, the, the main, the main uh, cost, the carbon cost of building nuclear reactors is actually concrete. And um, some of the developments I've seen in modern, what they call modular nuclear reactors, are getting to the stage where they're, they're almost no concrete. They're, there's even a, a, a Dutchman trying to build nuclear reactors inside shipping containers. You know, very like 40 megawatt stations rather than the one or two gigawatt stations we, we are used to. Uh, <clears throat> but the, the amount of energy you get out of the system is enormous. And so the, the original carbon footprint is trivial compared to the energy over time. But the thing is, we, we can't produce nuclear power stations at scale right now. We don't have the engineers. Uh, we, we still have an approval process which slows them down. People are designing modular nuclear reactors, but we're not building them yet. So all that stuff for me argues in favor of an early push towards solar and wind, because at least we're doing that on a grand scale and we can easily expand that scale. So my feeling would be we dive in, first of all, for a rapid expansion in, in solar and wind, and then we'd put maximum effort into trying to design small-scale nuclear power stations and, and, and their modular stations, and that would get us a potential solution. But I still can't see us avoiding something like, you know, of the order of 50 to 75% fall in energy consumption. And that means to have anything like a decent society, we're going to have to ration. Opinion. What is the best case scenario working after the climate? Best case scenario? Um, <laughs> best case scenario, we don't trigger a huge structural change in the climate. So we still have three circulation cells in the northern hemisphere. We have only a minor problem, like we're going to lose you know, 10, 20 million people in a, a crisis, and that wakes us all up and we do something serious about it. The, the worst case scenario is we do nothing and we end up in Mad Max. And that's really the big fear that I've got, that our future is a Mad Max world. Yeah? Yes, so you're um, talking about control being well. Uh, does that mean like living in a constant recession, like every single trimester or whatever, you, you say every single year you're having negative GDP growth compared with the previous yeah, year? Yeah, I mean the whole obsession we have with growth is just a crazy element of our culture because 
that wasn't an obsession at all until the 1750s. If you look at the, 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 the continuity that existed in previous civilization, but because you didn't have much change technologically or in energy consumption over time. It's only once we discovered coal and how to use coal to power industrial processes that we started expecting growth. And then growth has become our way of avoiding redistribution. Yeah. Don't worry about this, the share of the cake, let's make the cake grow bigger. That become the dominant argument. And neoclassicals have been cheerleaders for that for the last century and a, and a half. So we can't have, I think it was uh, Bu um, uh, Buchanan who made the comment that if anybody, anybody believing in uh, infinite growth on a finite planet is either if planet is a mad or an economist, <laughs> and probably both. And so in terms of on this bias here, we have to restrict ourselves to a much, much smaller proportion of the planet than we currently absorb. And when you look at calculations of how much of the planet we alone are consuming as a species, the thing called the global, the human ecological footprint, if you search for that on the web, you'll find it. They claim we're humans alone are consuming 1.6 to 1.8 times the renewable level of the planet. That's forgetting all the other wild animals. Now, Sloan, Sloan Wilson, who's a leading, he now died recently, but a leading biologist arguing against how humans have behaved, has said we have to re treat it, we, we should really regard ourselves as custodians of life. The most valuable thing on this planet is life and we're destroying it. So he said what we should be really doing is reserving at least half the planet for other species. Make that our objective. And then our role as humans is to maintain the conditions for life. That's what we should be doing. Anything but what we have been doing. And that's what I think you should learn. System dynamics. And you know, please download Minsky, have a play. I have a manual for it, which is pretty incomplete, but it still exists. <laughs> so give it a try. Any questions? Uh, <laughs>